Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Unfound Now, the monthly series right here on YouTube that I've been conducting since the summer of 2020. I am, of course, Unfound's host, Ed Denso. I hope everybody is doing fantastic out there. Today, I'll be talking about the disappearance of John Tipton, who's 19 years old. He went missing on January 14th of 2023, and he went missing from the town of Sevierville, Tennessee, which also happens to be the birthplace of Dolly Parton. So if you're unfamiliar with Unfound Now, uh, this is the re- these are some of the reasons that I started doing this series back in 2020. Number one, publicity. All of these disappearances that occur from day to day deserve more publicity than they get. And Unfound Now is a way to do that. Number two is education. I'm all about education. Many of you now know that I've done speaking engagements at uh, a variety of universities, mostly here in Florida, but I've also done one in Louisiana. And I'm in the process of creating a uh, teachable course on teachable.com regarding disappearances uh, that will be available hopefully sometime within the next three to four months. It's going to take a little while to put that all together. But we are all about the education at Unfound. And then finally, number three, the main, one of the main reasons that I do these Unfound Nows is to give you insight. How do I think about disappearances when I read about them for the first time? And in fact, many times I speak with uh, some of my assistants about them. What do they think? What are their insights? How do we take in the information given that uh, we cover disappearances all the time, uh, is it any different from how you do it? This gives you an opportunity to examine that. As with every episode of Unfound Now, I always come to you with some educational points, and these are the three for this particular episode. And allow me to scroll down here. Uh, The points of importance for John Tipton's disappearance. Number one... Anytime, anywhere. Number two, the mystery of water. And number three, America, we have a problem. So now I'm going to go to the map, show you uh, where John was, when he, where he was last seen. I'm going to uh, go through a little bit of a route, where he was at that night before he went uh, missing. And then when I get back, I will delve uh, deeply into those three points of importance for this episode. Okay, uh, let's go over some locations for the disappearance of John Tipton. Uh, To remind you, 19 years old, from Sevierville, Tennessee, January 14th, 2023, so about a month and a half ago. I'm just going to read to you, um, this is actually NamUs, and it's combined with some articles that have been written about John's disappearance, and you should know that as recently as a couple weeks ago, um, there have been searches done in the area trying to, f- to find him, and of course they're still unsuccessful. Uh, they've been up- unsuccessful, he is still missing. John left his employer, Krispy Kreme, at 2318 on January 14th, 2023. So that is this location right there. So 2318, that's 11, 18 p.m. to us lay people. He then went to the Waffle House in Sevierfield, Tennessee, and ate ate at a high top stool. So he ate, I guess another way to put that is at the counter. And that Waffle House is just south, not very far south of the Krispy Kreme right there, at the, down there at the bottom of the screen. Near midnight, so let's say he was at the Waffle House for a half hour. Near midnight, John pulls his Hummer into the parking lot of Smoky, the Smoky Mountain Knife Works and parks between the building and State Route 66 Winfield Dunn Parkway that is up here at the top of the screen. You can also see to go from the Krispy Kreme to the Waffle House up here, driving, it's only 5.7 miles, 14 minutes, but as 
I stated he was at the Krispy Kreme, went down here to the Waffle House, ate at the counter, and then by not quite midnight, he was already up here at the Smoky Mountain Knife Works. John, as uh, there must be, there is video there, and it says that he, he uh, sat in his vehicle for a few moments, then he got out without a coat, we have to remember this is January, in Tennessee, and walked north through the parking lot towards the river side of the building. This river is right here at the top of the screen. I'm going to zoom in on that in a moment. When he left his vehicle, John left the keys and his cell phone in the cup holder of the Hummer. And not in this article, but I think I read somewhere else that while he was at the Waffle House, he actually did not eat everything that he ordered, and he took a to-go box with him, which makes this disappearance, I guess, even a little bit harder to understand, maybe. But allow me to now zoom in on this location of Smoky Mountain Knife Works right here. Um, there we go. So it was his vehicle was parked in the parking lot between this route and the building. So right there, as you can see, the French Broad River is right there. Very, very short walk. Um, doesn't look like there would be any fences or a fence or anything else to keep him going down to the, the water's edge if he wanted to do so. Um, and my belief is that this river flows uh, east to west, so I guess right to left on your screen. And so if you, if you want to take a look downstream here, if we are to believe that he really did go into the water, it gets very windy, and as I've stated on some of these disappearances before, uh, even the regular disappearances or the, the regular podcast that, I, that comes out every Friday, that when you see rivers that wind like this, you have to remember that the water, that means the water is really going to slow down, especially at the inside of the turns. And that's why you get a lot of silt and everything on one side of the turn and not on the other. And in fact... Um, going back to like science in high school or something, it'll eventually in maybe a thousand years or something like this, this water will continue to cut into this land and eventually this curve will not be here at all. It'll just be straight due to the mass of the water eating away at the land. And in fact, if you can see signs of that for other rivers that used to have be very windy and now they're very straight, and you can kind of see where they used to be, but they're not there now. Because that silt keeps piling up, piling up, piling up, fills in, and then the water also eats away at the land. So what this means is when the water slows down like this, the silt drops out. Well, anything heavy drops to the bottom. And that could be logs. It could be uh, anything. Anything that ends up in the water that may have a tendency to float. Uh, if the water slows down that gives that the opportunity to whatever that object is to sink. And my opinion, just the opinion on how I understand this would have to know how far, how rough the water was, how fast it was flowing at this time for, um, for how far John could have down, gone downstream if, in fact, he went into the river. But given how windy this is, of course, my prediction would be that he would not be found too far downstream. But they've looked, haven't found anything. So maybe that leads us to the idea that he didn't go into the river at all. And then on top of that, like I said before, it is curious... And this does remind me of a story uh, I've heard uh, since I moved to the Clearwater area that I will relay in a moment. But he went to the Waffle House right down there at the bottom of the screen, didn't finish everything he uh, ate, took a to-go box, but still, just minutes later, he's up there walking away from his vehicle and leaving the keys in it, his cell phone in it, in the cup holder. Could it be that he went down there, let's say, to go to the bathroom and mistakenly fell in? I guess it's possible. 
Uh, did he go up there to meet somebody and something happened? I guess that's possible. No video of that. Of course, we have video of him. I guess there's nobody else on the video um, that uh, they have there. So maybe that's ruled out. Maybe the person knew how to get around the video. But that to-go box thing is something that just our understanding of people, we, we're still not sure why people do these things. And the story I have uh, from an EMT I spoke to years ago is that a woman uh, jumped off the Skyway Bridge. The Skyway Bridge is down here at the southern end of Pinellas County. It's the bridge that goes between St. Petersburg, Florida, and Bradenton in Sarasota. It's a huge bridge they've used it for commercials. Beautiful bridge. I think it was built back in the 1990s after the old bridge got hit by a, a ship and some people got killed. But she went up to the top of that bridge, parked her car, and jumped. And it is known as a suicide spot. When you go over that bridge at the top of it, and it's so high over the water that cruise ships can go under it. That's how high it is over the water. But it was discovered that even on the day that... And she traveled over that bridge every day for her work. And just that day, she decided she was going to jump. On that day, she still stopped for coffee, even though she knew she was going to jump that day. Maybe she doesn't, wasn't sure. Maybe, but she still stopped for coffee. And what the EMT told me, because the EMT was on call at the time and uh, got called to the scene of this, that he heard that she jumped into the water. The police got there. The coffee in the cup in her car was still warm. See, she had just gotten coffee not long before she went to that bridge and jumped. These things are hard to understand. And we still, uh, despite us knowing a lot about the human body, uh, suicide is something that is still a, a huge mystery in my opinion. Not saying that necessarily John Tipton committed suicide, but... The circumstances uh, probably point us in that direction, even though nobody actually saw him go into the water. So what I'm saying is just because he got that to-go box with food in it, you should not automatically say, oh, nobody who would commit suicide would actually get a to-go box with food in it. Uh, I, I can assure you it's not that clear regarding disappearances. It's not that clear cut. So that's the map. And now go back to talk about those three points of importance for John's disappearance. And I'm back. Before I go into these points of importance for John Tipton's disappearance, I would like to remind you to subscribe to this uh, Unfound podcast channel right here on YouTube. That's the little box right down here on your screen. Please consider becoming a member by hitting the join button below the screen. And if you'd like to contribute in some other way, maybe you should think about uh, joining us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. And of course, please give this video a thumbs up. All right, those points of importance, starting with number one, and if you see me looking off to my left, your right, I do not do these unfound nows off the top of my head. Uh, I do have some notes on my other laptop, which is the, si the side of the uh, one I'm using as the camera. Number one, anytime, anywhere. This is one of those points where I, I'm really not sure the public can understand that, understand this. And unfortunately, people don't really understand this until it happens to them. And when I say happen to them, it, it happens to somebody that they know very well, a friend, a, a close family member. They don't realize that disappearances can happen at any time, anywhere, to anybody. It may depend on who the person is, the choices that person is making in his or her life. And then, of course, it could come down to the circumstances as, as well, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But John's is a perfect example of this, in that he's out there, he's going to the Waffle House, he's leaving work, he even took leftovers away from the Waffle House, and then he parks 
uh, his uh, vehicle where it was found, and he walks off, leaving it unlocked. The key's in it. His cell phone is there. Just something that, if you didn't know about disappearances at all, say you didn't know that disappearances were a thing on Earth, and you told somebody that, they would completely reject it. That's how disappearances happen. The truth is that the circumstances of John's disappearance disappearance uh the circumstances are not that uncommon only because a lot of people still don't understand how disappearances happen do they believe that they are uncommon this is actually more common type of scenario than the general public realizes it and it's very sad i'll get into some of my analysis at the end but I want all of you to understand this now that I've gone through the circumstances in the map section and you think, wow, this is just so, so unique, so rare. It's not. It's not. And some of Unfound's examples, uh, for example, Susie Lyle. I'm sure she did not believe when she was getting off of that bus on the Albany uh, campus uh, where she was going to school that somebody would abduct her. I'm sure she did not expect that. Um, Ronald McNutt, there were no signs that he would drive off like he did, and it is believed that his remains have been found, but they were so badly burned in a fire due to a wildfire uh, with remains being found in his truck that to this day DNA testing has still not been able to be done. But could anybody have predicted once he dropped off, was it his grandson or... Uh, that uh, he would draw, he would drive off after that. Probably not. Layla Faulkner, and this one, uh, this disappearance is kind of on my mind because I just uh, posted it on the page, the Facebook page on Facebook, um, the Unfound page on Facebook, just a couple days ago. She was at home with her family, with her parents, with her child, and then all of a sudden, her mother went to look for her in the house. Gone. Never seen again. And then another uh, decent example of this is Stephen Adams, who came home from school. And it seems that somebody was waiting for him. And Stephen and this guy went for a ride, and Stephen never came back. I think one of the big misconceptions or the ways we delude ourselves in our lives is that we think that we're, we're all living our own movie but we also think that, given that we maybe believe our life is like a movie, is that there's going to be a run-up to something unusual, rare, absolutely great, absolutely horrible. There's going to be some run-up to it. There's going to be dramatic music or something like that. And, of course, that's not the way life is. These things happen out of nowhere. No different than somebody driving home from work. One day goes through an intersection, somebody blows a stop sign and slams into the side of the car. Just out of nowhere. Everything is normal, and then everything is the opposite of normal. This is the way disappearances are. Yes, it may involve uh, a bad relationship or an addiction or something like that, but we've covered uh, many disappearances on Unfound that have nothing to do with any of those types of... um, Issues that can get people in trouble, um, that can create drama in people's lives to the point that they become targets. We've covered a lot of disappearances that aren't like that at all. Just want you to remember that. So anytime, anywhere. Number two, the mystery of water. Unfound has covered many disappearances. Uh, We've covered over 280 disappearances total already in six and a half years. But we've covered many where people were last seen near bodies of water. And I have a list of uh, just a partial list uh, in my notes. Jake Lachalet, Ben Archer, Shane Fell, Crystal Bailey. But still all those people that I just named and many more have not been found. They weren't found in that river or that creek or that lake for one reason or another. So even though we think we understand the flow of water, and I'm sure that we could easily go back to that night of uh, when John went missing into the river that was nearby, we could check out what the flow was, what the temperature of the water was, how high was it, how low was it, 
could check out all of these things. We could have it just down to an exact science what the river was doing that night. And still, it seems that trying to find people who seemingly go into rivers uh, is not, it's not an exact science at all. Uh, it's very, very hit and miss. Why that is, still not sure. If I knew, I would tell you. But it's just not as solid as I think the public thinks. That, oh, it's a river and we know how it's flowing. We just need to go so many miles down river and we can look at the banks of each side of the river. Are there any places that a, that a body would get hung up? This is, of course, presuming that John did go into the water. And this should be very easy to uh, figure out. It's not. And there are many disappearances that Unfound is still not covered that are exactly like those that I just named. Where we have the time, we have a sighting. We can even have situations, you can even find these on NamUs and on uh, the Charlie Project, where people have even been seen jumping into uh, a river. And we know for sure that that person went into the river person still missing. In fact, just a few months ago, I covered a disappearance from Alaska. A guy was on a cruise ship, went into, um, wasn't even like the Pacific Ocean. It was like a canal for these cruise ships. He went into the water. People saw him go in. They heard him yell or something. Still not been found all these months later. And so water is still a mystery, even though we can chart it, we can measure it, we can do all these sort of things. Uh, with water, we have sonar and boats going out and divers. It's still a huge mystery when it comes to disappearances. Now, um, we have to think about something, though. I said allegedly nobody actually saw John go in to that river. We have to remember that. So did John just make it look like he went into the water and actually he did something else? I'll get into that analysis uh, once I'm done with uh, point of importance number three. And point number three is, America, we have a problem. If we are to believe that John really did, this 19-year-old really did go in uh, to that river for purposes, whether he was on something or it was just a, a, a choice made uh, of in a clear mind. He had a clear mind to decide to go into this river, which would, of course, be very unsafe at night in January. Uh, very cold water. You'd be overcome by the temperature of the water um, very quickly. If we're to think that he went in there by his own choice, this just furthers the idea, I think, that has come up on Unfound Now Before, and it's come up on my live show and other places where I've written blogs about disappearances is that do we have a problem here in the United States with our culture? I continue to state, you can look it up the, uh, the statistics yourselves that suicides continue to go up in the United States. Drug addiction is way up in the United States. This is supposed to be uh, a land of opportunity, a land of plenty Why are people choosing to do this? And especially young people. Maybe we can get into a a debate about older people and maybe they're diagnosed with some terminal disease or something and they know things aren't going to get any better. I hope to not ever get to that point in my life, but it could happen. And I'm not ready to, to judge those people for the decisions that they make. But when... We have so many teenagers, 20-something-year-olds. There's nothing that I've heard about John to believe that um, he had any overt problems in his life. Here he was. He was going to work, and he's driving a Hummer and all of this. What is going on? It's something that I think we as Americans, I think we're denying. That there is something going on that um, is not right, that the suicide rate is up greatly from just 50 years ago when I was born. And when I think about it, I think about uh, the statistics from East Germany, 
of course, East Germany, Germany divided into West and East Germany for all those years before they came back together in, what was it, when the wall fell in 1989, they become unified Germany in 1990, but there was a stark contrast between the suicide rates, the rate in West Germany compared to East Germany. In fact, East Germany went to long lengths to hide how many people in East Germany were committing suicide uh, there. Huge, and in fact, it's the topic of, uh, one of the topics of the movie, The Lives of Others, if you've ever seen that German film, one of my favorite movies. And so when I think about what has gone on in the United States over the past 50 years, that's what I think of. Now, you, now I would say as an American, the East Germans, they had it really tough. I would not have wanted to live there. The United States is not East Germany. And still we have a, a rate of suicide that continues to go up. If we're to believe, and the reason I'm only talking about this is we must think about this uh, regarding John's disappearance, because that's certainly what it looks like. So America, we have a problem if anybody is willing to uh, take a look at it. It could be a social media problem. I was just reading some items about that recently, how especially among young girls, social media raises their stress levels, uh, causes more depression. I don't think anybody should be surprised by that. It's a lot of things probably put together. We can surely do better. So my insights into John's disappearance. What's what's tough for me to analyze for me to analyze why it's hard for me to analyze this is because I've tried to look into who John Tipton was because if you don't know, if this is the first time you've ever watched me uh, talk about a disappearance, one of my sayings that I've created a few years ago is that disappearances are about people, not about circumstances. If you understand the person, you don't even need to know the circumstances to be to accurately guess how that person went missing, why that person went missing. The circumstances, dates, times, phone pings, and all those things, that only helps us try to solve the disappearance. Okay? But at their core, disappearances are about people. And frankly, I just don't know enough about John Tipton to make a, a really good analysis of what was going on in his life at the time. Because I think if I knew that, then maybe we could analyze what he was doing that night uh, a little bit better. Now, is it possible that he faked this? That he wanted to make it look like he went into the, into the river when really he didn't? Did he want to um, pull off some sort of disappearance and go change his life, change his identity, move somewhere else? Like we discovered in 2022, this... Um, Guy from Massachusetts, his last name was Hoagland, H-O-A-G-L-A-N-D. He went missing from Massachusetts, and it turned out that he had been living in New York under an assumed name for several years and had just decided he was a married man with children, just decided to leave his life and do something different. And had he not died of a heart attack or a stroke, I think would all still be stumped as to what actually happened to him. Could uh, John have done this? Certainly possible. I don't know if there are any facts to rule that out. Um, but in uh, this Hoagland guy's situation, he did not try to make it look like he committed suicide. He was just there one day and gone the next. We have to keep that in mind. I would also uh, remind all of you that people faking their deaths, um, usually when people do that, it's because they're in trouble with the law or something like that. There's nothing that I could find to think that uh, John was in that s situation. But do people, people f try to fake their deaths? Have people successfully done that? Probably. You know, the, the tough part is we only know about the people who um, were eventually caught. They faked their deaths and then it's somewhere down the road through DNA or something, uh, we figure out that yeah, it was faked. We don't know about the people who faked it, got away with it, because we're still thinking that they're dead. We have to keep that in mind. Uh, I would say, though, my experience of over 280 disappearances is that the odds that John Tipton faked his death that night 
uh, are very low. Now, why he would have chose to do what he did that night then, hard to tell. I just don't know uh, enough about him to say. But um, it's just so, so uh, you know, I'm not here to, if his family watches this, I'm not here to diminish any hope. But I think they just need to understand, or the public needs to understand, that people doing this and faking their deaths or making it look like one thing when it's another is very rare. In fact, what's much more likely in my experience with disappearance is that some suspect wants to make it look like the missing person did something when really something else happened. So that would be foul play. It happens more likely in foul play with a, a killer wanting to make it look like the person committed suicide or did this or did that instead of it actually being a straight out murder. That's much more likely than somebody creating uh, their own ruse. Um, but my perception as I have here, my perception though is when the public can't latch onto a firm reason for the perceived suicide, then the public defaults to a fake death. And I think that that maybe what's going on here with John Tipton is that if you don't know him well and you see this young man, uh, you just want to reject the idea that he actually committed suicide. So you start thinking, well, it has to be something else. There are no facts to point you in another direction. It's just you maybe just don't want to believe it. And unfortunately, we can refuse to believe things. That doesn't make them untrue. So that is my analysis for the disappearance of John Tipton uh, on this episode of Unfound Now. Uh, once again, please remember to like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and I will see you again next month. Thanks for watching.